Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third installment of the 45th annual Midwest Philosophy Colloquium on the philosophy of conspiracy theory. I'm happy to introduce our speaker tonight, Steve Clark. Steve writes about a wide variety of topics, including religious violence, cognitive enhancement, healthcare ethics, the cognitive science of religion, miracles, and many other interesting topics. It's really an honor to have him with us tonight, and his talk will be called The New Conspiracism and the Old Conspiracism. Our plan, as usual, is to have a lecture followed by a discussion panel composed of the other speakers in the colloquium. Then we'll open the floor to questions from the audience, so just submit any questions you have by using the Q&A button. All right, so let's get started. Steve, why don't you uh, take it away? Okay, so let me start by sharing something. So this is, uh, so um, that's just the, hope you can see that. Um, that's the cover of a book that I'm going to be discussing. So the book is called A Lot of People Are Saying, The New Conspiracism and the Assault on Democracy. So that's um, what I'm going to be discussing. So I will now remove that so you've had a chance to see what it is and um so the next thing is i'm going to share um uh, my so i've called this a running sheet but it's just a kind of set of notes about what i'm actually going to talk about so can the running sheet be seen now it's very yep. low tech good good okay so this book um a lot of people saying it came out last year um and it posits that there's a thing called the new conspiracism, okay? Um, and it characterizes this new conspiracism as a threat to democracy. Now, um, the book's um, done very well by all accounts. It's um, been cited 60 times in only one year. It's had uh, special issues of journals discussing it and it's had glowing reviews. Um, I'm not so impressed by the book, so I'm going to um, tell you what I think is wrong with it, okay? Um, now, the starting point is that Muirhead and Rosenbaum, they're a couple of um, political theorists, um, they make this contrast between this new conspiracism and old or classic conspiracism. And I think the new stuff has come about fairly recently. They're, their most, uh, their oldest example of new conspiracism is uh, birth of theories about Barack Obama, which go back to 2008. So anything before then is clearly um, old conspiracism. Okay, so they, they characterize the old stuff like this. Classic conspiracism tries to make sense of a disorderly and complicated world by insisting that powerful people control the course of events. And they depict the classic conspiracists as insisting on proportionality and un undertaking painstaking detective work. Okay, so that's their characterization of an old conspiracist. Now, the new stuff they see is very different. Um, so the new conspiracists posit odious designs, but not the how or why, and often not even the who. Okay. The typical form of new conspiracism is bare assertion. Okay, and they have in mind Donald Trump going rigged, stuff like that, as the new conspiracism. But, so they think rigged elections are examples of new conspiracism. They think birth allegations are, and they think Pizzagate and QAnon are. Okay? okay, now here are some charges they make against the new conspiracism. The first one, and this is, they make clear this is the most important is that it's conspiracism without theory, okay? So none of these examples, they say, have any theory about it. Um, then the other charges are, it's validated by repetition rather than evidence. It's satisfied with conclusions that allegations are true enough rather than actually true. Rejects the epistemic authority of experts. And with QAnon, they have a, they throw in an extra one uh, not only does it fail to explain anything at all, it lacks element, elementary coherence and defies common sense. Okay, so not a good theory. Now, um, the, um, 
you might so, so a lot of people think this they think that the internet may have changed conspiracy theorizing okay so conspiracy theorizing goes on the internet comes along and now it's a different game so significant numbers of people think this um Muirhead and Rosenblum aren't arguing that, but they are arguing that um, the new conspiracy has been given life by the internet. Okay, so they basically think um, the internet gives the new conspiracists greater opportunities to go in for repetition. Okay, and as they point out, with the internet, repeating charges takes no effort. Okay, so the internet is a they characterise as an aid to the new conspiracist. But it's not the it's not the whole story, and they think that old conspiracism is still continuing along. The two things are continuing side by side. So they're not saying old conspiracism is no longer. They're saying there's both forms of conspiracism going along. Okay. Now, I don't think any of this is right. Um, I think there is no new conspiracism. Um, I think um, there. Distinction between the new and the old is misguided. Um, and um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to I'll start with a discussion of how I understand conspiracy theorizing, so some sort of background information. Then I'll look at um, some of the charges against uh, that they make about new conspiracism, and I'll show that it's validated by repetition, satisfied true enough and rejects experts. And I'll just give you examples of uh, what are old conspiracy theories that do all of this. Okay? Then I'll look at the quest I'll look at the actual theories that are their core examples of new conspiracism. And I'll demonstrate to you that they have theories behind them. Okay? And the final section I'm just going to discuss uh, the internet and repetition and so on. And I do think there's something there, but it's not what they think it is. Okay, so that, that's the order of procedure. All right, so moving right along. Um, so just how I, this will just be background to how I understand conspiracy theorizing, theories and theorizing. So um, I basically go with Brian, um, conspiracy theory, here's his definition. I'm not exactly fussed about the wording of the definition, it's got, it's got the right idea. It's a proposed explanation of some historical event or events in terms of the significant causal agency of a relatively small group of persons, the conspirators, acting in secret. Okay, so you could nitpick with that, and I'm not going to, um, <coughs> I'm not going to fight about it. But I do think it's basically right. It's what I want. Um, now, on this account, a theory can be a conspiracy theory as well as an official story. Okay, um, and some people think, well, that's not really how ordinary language goes. When a theory becomes the official theory, we no longer think of it as a conspiracy theory. So um, we don't really think of the um, Richard Nixon conspired um, to. <coughs> Um, cause the Watergate uh, Hotel to be bugged theory as a conspiracy theory anymore, because it's true, or we believe it's true. Okay, so it's now become an official theory. It was a conspiracy theory. We now don't want to talk about it like that, but it's the same theory. Okay, similarly, the Al Qaeda theory of the events of 9 11. Um, so that's an official theory. Most people accept it. Um, if you look at historical documentaries and so on, that's the theory you'll be exposed to. Um, so it seems odd to call it a conspiracy theory, but it's a theory about conspirators acting in secret and causing a series of things. So it's a conspiracy theory. Okay. Now, conspiracy theories are in competition with other theories that purport to explain particular phenomena. So fairly classic example of this is um, the Al-Qaeda theory, this official theory about the events of 9-11, um, is in competition with the controlled demolition theory of at least the subset of events that took place in New York on the 11th of September 2001. 
So the Al-Qaeda theory says, look, members of this terrorist organization, Al-Qaeda, flew planes into towers one and two. This caused them to catch fire and eventually collapse because of the fires. And debris from tower one hits tower seven, causing fire in it, and then it collapsed. <coughs> so that's the Al-Qaeda theory. The controlled demolition theory says, no, 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 no. The buildings were pre-wired for a controlled demolition. The controlled demolition was timed um, to occur shortly after the planes in it. Okay. <coughs> so there. Yeah. Um, so not, not COVID. Um, so um, those theories are in competition with one another. Now, um, how are we going to assess which theory to accept? Well, um, like any other uh, scientific theory, as it were, um, what we're going to do is look at which one best explains the uh, set of events in question. Um, so, and there's basically two considerations with reference to the best explanation, which is, I think, the um, procedure we apply here. So, one is we um, uh, assess explanations for the capacity to account for observed evidence. Um, and the other is we consider whether and to what extent they exemplify explanatory virtues. So explanatory virtues are uh, things like simplicity, elegance, fruitfulness, and best fit in background theories. Okay, so that's straight out of Peter Lipton's classic account of interest in the best explanation. Now, Sometimes we're not going to get a clear result that way, and there'll be room for disagreement. Um, so you might get two theories that um, neither fully explain what the phenomenon in question or, <coughs> or um, both have anomalies. So there's an apparent anomaly with the, um, the official story about the collapse of the World Trade Center which is it doesn't look like the fires in the buildings could have been hot enough to collapse a steel uh, frame building. At least that's what uh, controlled demolition theorists say. But there's also a problem with the controlled demolition theory. And the problem is that um, the, um, the story about buildings being pre-wired for controlled demolition, well, the way this is usually done is that um, inner walls of buildings have to be torn out and um, explosives planted, you know, some weeks in advance. Now, you might think of those people working in the buildings, many of whom survived the events of 9-11, someone would have noticed this, but it appears that they didn't, okay? So both of these theories have anomalies. Um, so one way of uh, sorting out which theory you believe is just to figure out which anomalies you think is more serious. Now, I happen to think that the the anomalies to control the emission theory are much more serious, but not everyone agrees with me, okay? Um, and there's no sort of clear way of sort of saying these anomalies are definitely more serious than these other ones. Um, and the other thing is with inference to the best explanation, there are these considerations that have a kind of subjective element to them. So the best fit with background beliefs is the best fit with background beliefs I happen to have. So if you have some different background beliefs, about, say, putting explosives in buildings, um, you might find the controlled demolition theory to be more plausible than I do. Okay, when we can't make a sort of a clear decision, a distinction between theories on the spot, what we can often do is go for a diachronic comparison um, um, of uh, rival theories. So to do this, we're not just going to look at um, the theories to sort of at the same time, we're going to look at how they progress over time. Okay. And um, so one thing that seemed very convincing about the Watergate theory is that Bernstein and Woodward, the journalists who are promoting it, seem to be getting sort of predictions right. <clears throat> and that's what uh, Imre Lakatos refers to a progressive research program. Okay, so the theory at the heart of it. Um, it doesn't have to be modified to account for new evidence that's come comes in. It's anticipating new evidence. Now, the opposite of this is a degenerating research program, and that's where new evidence comes in, but your theory doesn't hit it very well. 
So your theory has to be progressively modified uh, with more and more auxiliary hypotheses and changing initial conditions and so forth to, uh, to, to make it fit, okay? And over time, theories become um, quite baroque. Um, so <clears throat> if you look at Brian's paper where he discusses the Oklahoma City bombing theory, that one seems to be a good example of this. Okay, the theory just becomes more and more complicated over time. It loses the virtue of simplicity. Um, it's less likely to fit with background beliefs. So it becomes less attractive and less of good explanation. Okay, now, just a few more points about conspiracy theories before I go on. Okay, and I want to get these right because these will come back to us. Firstly, um, with classic conspiracy theories, a lot of them come in many different versions, okay? So there might be a core theory, uh, Kennedy assassination theory, um, that the official story is wrong, but there's many versions. It's been led to the FBI, the CIA, the KGB, the mafia, Cuban exiles in America, US military, Lyndon Johnson, Richard Nixon, Fidel Castro, and combinations of these groups and individuals conspired to have Kennedy assassinated. Okay, so <clears throat> lots of different theories with a core. Now, a lot of theories, this is the classic ones, are not fully fledged explanations at all. They're uh, explanation sketches. So, um, the, um, so, for example, the one about uh, Bill Castro, if you ask people to try and defend this, um, they'll give you a story about... Um, Blanking on the name of the guy who was Lee Harvey, Os Lee Harvey Oswald, the shooter in the Kennedy assassination theory, was involved in various organisations sort of pro-Cuba. What they won't tell you is <coughs> how exactly Fidel Castro caused uh, this to happen. Okay, so it's not a fully fledged explanation. It never has been. The theorists who run with it would like it to become a fully fledged explanation, but they haven't made sufficient process yet, progress yet. The third thing is that some conspiracy theories postulate hidden aspects of the world, okay? And these can be seen very bizarre to people <coughs> who are not familiar with conspiracy theories. So if you first hear about them cold, you think, what the? Um, so example, and this has come up in the other two talks, David Icke's uh, alien reptile theory. So Icke believes that the, um, the elite of the world, including something like, I think, 43 US presidents, it's going way back, um, most of the British royal families and British prime ministers are all shape-shifting uh, lizards. Okay, so the, the lizard isn't quite right because they're not literally lizards, they're aliens that look like lizards, but they can shape-shift at will into human form. Okay, and uh, they're controlling the world secretly. They, they don't want people to know about this. Now, you might think, well, who would believe that silly theory? Well, apparently 12 million Americans believe it, um, surveys show. Um, Ike himself is pretty popular. He's put out 20 books defending his unusual theory. They all sell well. The most popular ones gone into six editions. Um, he also does these long seminars that um, cost a lot of money. Apparently, thousands of people go to them. So he had one at Wembley Arena, the famous uh, football stadium in London, and he had 8,000 people attend. So people are into this. Uh, the bizarreness of the theory is not a barrier for people to accept. OK, so that's, that's the background. It's where I'm coming from thinking about conspiracy theories. Now, Okay, so the first thing is what I want to establish is that um, the um, old conspiracy theories used all these techniques, repetition, denigration of experts, and appeal to true enoughness. So I'll start with repetition. Now, the classic example of repetition being used by an old conspiracy theorist is Joe McCarthy. Okay, so in 1950, Senator Joseph. McCarthy makes the public accusation that 
precise figure, 205 communists have infiltrated the US State Department. <coughs> okay, it, it gives it additional plausibility by having the exact number. Um, when asked about this, he's unable to name a single one of them. Okay, unable to provide any evidence whatsoever. This doesn't stop him. He runs around America giving talks, um, repeating this allegation. And this seems to be quite effective as a technique. He's re-elected in 1952 to the US Senate. Upon re-election, becomes chair of the Committee of Government Operations in the Senate and of its subcommittee of investigations. He uses this as a sort of a bully pulpit to um, go after various government departments um, and um, accuse them of being um, uh, full of communists. He overreaches in 1954 um, when he makes faiths Face the allegations about the, against the U.S. Army, and people arc up, is it, you know? Um, so, um, and they complain that look, uh, we've had enough of this. Okay, um, you know, you haven't shown us that there are, there are these communists you keep uh, you keep claiming there are, or you've shown us very few of them, and these charges against the army you just haven't heard of this. Okay, um, he overreached. Republicans who complained about him, he then turned on, um, including President Eisenhower, and um, he's then sanctioned by the Senate and disappears into obscurity. Okay, but his chief tool is repetition, and it's very effective. Okay, and with experts, well, if you look at um, classic literature like Richard Hofstadter's uh, stuff on the paranoid style, um, a lot of 19th century populist conspiracy theorists denigrate experts. And they denigrate them because they're part of perceived uh, East Coast American elites um, who have a kind of an agenda. Um, so uh, they're not to be trusted. Okay? So um, they're not to be trusted because they're part of this uh, elite that, you know, they might have the smarts, but they lack common sense. Um, now, um, the other thing is there are specific conspiracy theories um, which involve uh, experts who are alleged to be part of the conspiracy. So here's, a, here's an example, 1988, uh, this guy Cantwell, he's one of the various AIDS conspiracy theorists. There's lots of these theories about AIDS, who created it and why. Um, he claims HIV is a genetically modified organism created by the US government scientists with the aim of killing homosexuals and the experts on AIDS in the US government are part of the conspiracy. So of course he's not going to trust them. So there's nothing new about denigrating the experts and conspiracy theorizing. Now what about true enoughness? Now part of the problem is figuring out what true enoughness is. Okay, so Muirhead and Rosenblum they, they start off with this quote from Donald Trump. Even if it isn't totally true, there's something there. Okay, that's their quote. And then they do, that. they try and characterise this. And frankly, they do a terrible job. Okay? They, they have three different goes. They say it's neither belief nor disbelief. They say it's consistent with unlikely to have happened. And they relate it to unfalsifiability. Okay? Now, <clears throat> to me, the phrase, there's something there, doesn't mean neither belief nor disbelief. It means belief in something there. It doesn't mean consistent with unlikely to happen, unlikely to have happened. It means there's something there. And I just don't see the connection with unfalsifiability. They haven't, they haven't made it at all. Um, we can make headway with this. This is another thing they quote. Well, look at the, we'll look at this other quote, and this is by um, Sarah Hutton. Sanders, and she was asked, um, so, so what happened was this, um, Trump um, tweeted a link to a video, and it's supposedly about a Muslim immigrant to America who um, had committed some act of violence on a citizen, an American citizen. Um, and it soon became clear that the video was a fake. Okay, now Sarah Huckabee Sanders is the US, uh, I forget what her title was, but she's the, the mouthpiece for Trump at the time. Um, 
she responded like this. She said, whether it's a real video, the threat is real. Okay, so she's not concerned about <coughs> being real. And that, that's, uh, that's their other example of what they think is true enoughness. And I think this gives us some insight into what's really going on here. What true enoughness means is true enough to establish a particular intended point. Okay, so the video may be a fake, but the point is to show that um, Muslim immigrants to America are a threat. Um, so um, that's the point of it. And it's true enough in the sense that, well, you know, we'll whip out some other Muslims committed an act of violence uh, against uh, a regular non-Muslim American. And you know, that'll, that'll do to establish the point. Okay, so true enough to establish a particular point. So, if I'm right, then um, it would be true enough to establish that Barack Obama was ineligible to be the US president if you were to establish, uh, say, the charges um, that uh, Trump repeats that he was born in Kenya. But what would be true enough is if, say, he was born in Tanzania, okay? Because then he would be ineligible to be US president. But what would not be true enough is if he was born in Tennessee rather than Hawaii, because then, well, yeah, he'd be lying about his birth certificate, which says he'd be born in Hawaii, but he would still be eligible to run for president. So that's my take on true enough. It's figure out what the point of the um, claim is, and then true enough um, means some other information you can slot in that makes the same point. Okay, now if that's what's going on with true enoughness, then I think we have clear examples of it in the old conspiracism. So, <clears throat> along with the Red Scare in the 1950s, there was also what was known as the Lavender Scare. So, McCarthy, in um, addition to persecuting homosexuals, sorry, in addition to persecuting communists, um, succeeded in um, having a lot of homosexuals um, sacked from their jobs in the US government. Um, now, you might say, well, how, how does that work? How come someone who is running about trying to uncover communists succeeds in getting homosexuals sacked from their job? Well, there's a kind of a, there's a sane version of this and there's a there's a slightly insane one the same version is this at the time homosexuality was illegal and so the thought was if someone was shown to be homosexual then they would be um, a target for blackmail by communists therefore they could not remain in their current government jobs okay because communists are allegedly trying to infiltrate the government and will stop at nothing so we blackmail the homosexuals in Harvard. Now, so that's the same version. The insane version which McCarthy ran with and Edgar Hoover, Edgar Hoover seemed, Edgar Hoover seemed to go along with is that homosexual activity and the acceptance of communist ideology are really two sides of the same coin. They're both forms of uh, mental illness and related forms of un-American activity, okay? So if that's right, then showing that someone is a homosexual is true enough to establish that they're a communist. Okay? And it's certainly true enough to have them sacked and to further fuel the red scare. Okay? So I think true enoughness has been going on for a long time. All right, so that's the past. So none of these charges against the new conspiracies are actually new. Now, what about these new conspiracy theories? So here we're focusing on whether these theories actually have any theory behind them. And the way um, you and Rosenblum characterise it, um, the important point is to establish um, the how and the why of the theory. And they say none of these theories do that. Okay, so the first one is rigged elections. Well, when pushed, I mean, look, um, Trump came up with all sorts of uh, theories about how um, the most recent election was rigged. 
Um, he said the Dominion, uh, Dominion vote counting machines, he and all his allies said this, they uh, were manipulated to clip votes, votes from uh, into Biden. Uh, dead people voted, poll watchers, Republican poll watchers were obstructed, and signature verification machines were manipulated. So he's got to, and he, it was, you know, pointed out which states these allegations were about. Now, these theories don't appear to be very good. Um, courts didn't sort of go along with them. That's because, that's not because there was no theory, just that the theory was no good. So clearly the how is there and the why is obvious enough. People were reading elections, uh, allegedly reading elections, didn't want Trump to be elected. They wanted, um, they wanted Biden or some other candidate other than Trump to be elected. Okay, so that seems very clear that that's a theory. What about the birthers? Now, <clears throat> so you and Rosenblum seem to think there's no theory here. And they focus on this person called Paulie Cates, who's an interesting person. She's originally from Moldavia, um, but seemed to have ended up in California working as a dentist. Now, um, if we look at what she actually says about um, the Bertha conspiracy, um, she has quite a bit to say. She claims that Obama has a Kenyan passport. He says he's only got an American passport. No, he's got a Kenyan one. Of course, it says that, allegedly says that um, he's born in Kenya. Um, she claims that he's got dozens of fraudulent US social security numbers, which you might expect from a fraudster. Um, so, um, so, um, and um, as for how this, so, so the big, the big issue here is how did he, um, how did he succeed in getting his birth certificates, um, uh, his fake birth certificate written up? Okay. Well, she says, his, here's how it happens. His mother deliberately concealed the fact that his son was born in Kenya. And her initial, initial motivation was simply to avoid having to process his son through US immigration and to avoid missing out on US welfare payments. Okay? They might think, well, how can that happen? Well, it turns out, according to her, or to Tate's, Hawaii just has very lax standards for issuing birth certificates. You just sign a document saying, uh, well, I've had a kid, and off you go, they send you a birth certificate. So that's how she sees it. Now, this theory explains the how. Um, how it was uh, how it was done, and the why is pretty straightforward. Presumably Obama was in on this. He's ambitious. He says, "Look, <coughs> he says to himself, I want to be U.S. president. If people find out I'm really born in Kenya, I won't be allowed to be U.S. president. Um, but that's not going to stop me. Fortunately, my mother has provided this fraudulent birth certificate. I'm just going to run with it. Okay. Um, it's worth pointing out that birth birth allegations are nothing new to U.S. politics." So in the 19th century, there's an obscure US president called Chester Arthur, and he was dogged by birth allegations that he was born in Canada. And the guy could well have been born in Canada. He was the, um, the main theory was, the, I, mean, I think he was born in Maine or somewhere near the border, uh, is the main theory. Well, you know, the border wasn't heavily patrolled then, it could easily have um, been he was born in Canada. Um, John McCain has had um, birth allegations thrown against him a lot. And the reason was he was born in um, the Panama Canal zone. So it's a kind of a live question whether that makes him a US born citizen or not. Okay, so plenty of allegations trying to prevent him from running for president on these grounds. Okay, and the stats are a little ridiculous. Okay, so nothing new about birth allegations <coughs> and plenty of theory there. Now, what about Pizzagate and QAnon? So I'm going to treat these as, um, you know, one and the same, okay? QAnon is a kind of uh, an extension of Pizzagate. So the way this got going, in 2016, emails were hacked from the Democratic National Committee server um, and publicly released by WikiLeaks. Okay, so this is in the run-up if you remember the 2016 election. 
Now, some conspiracy theorists got together and attempted to decode these. And their decoding led them to think that a child sex trafficking ring was being run out of the Comet Ping Pong Pizzeria in Washington, D.C. Okay? That's Pizzagate. Now, QAnon takes off from there. And it says, well, yeah, this is all true. Um, and that's because there's a global elite who are largely comprised of child sex traffickers and pedophiles who worship Satan. Okay? So Satan's been added to the story. And the other thing that's been added to the story is someone called Q, who offers Q, Q is someone who's got Q clearance, higher clearance in the US government, and um, is um, offering Q drops. So little bits of information that um, can help reveal the theory. Um, now, a couple of points about this. So far, there's nothing incoherent about it. It's very weird, but it's not actually incoherent. Okay. Um, second thing is this is just the core theory. There are lots of it, it's like um, uh, it's like the Kennedy theories. There's lots of variations on it. You'll see in the media. Um, QAnon being described as sort of multiple theories and so forth. There's, there's lots of other things milling around it, but this is the main theory. Okay, now, the, this all seems pretty wacky, but what my starting point here is that, um, look, it's all built out of plausible elements. Okay, so this is just some basic facts. It seems that 300,000 children are trafficked each year but mostly for labour rather than for sexual purposes. There's a lot of child trafficking, including 17,000 in the United States. Okay, so that's something that's going on. Um, there are human traffickers who often communicate in code. They're conducting something an illegal activity, so they're going to communicate in code. Um, and there are pedophiles who are protected by elites. We know this: Jimmy Savile in the UK, Jeffrey Epstein in the US are people who clearly were pedophiles and clearly were protected by members of the elite. So um, the elements of this theory are all, uh, all realistic. Um, the whole the theory as a whole um, obviously overreaches, okay? But it's not because it's, um, you know, batshit crazy. It's because it's built out of, um, you know, real stuff. Now, um, with the Q and the Q drops, well, there's nothing unusual or new here. So QAnon is supposed to be this person with high up government clearance um, who uh, wants to be anonymous and releases information on the internet. Well, there's previously there's been FBI Anon and CIA Anon who are supposed to do the exact same thing with information from the FBI and CIA. Um, if you go back to Watergate, um, basically Bernstein and Woodward uh, crack the case because they've got assistance from Deep Throat, who is a real person who really is a government insider who's releasing information to them. Okay, So the theory itself, um, it seems to, it's a pretty batty theory, but there's a... Um, you know, there's a clear um, there's a clear story about why all this pedophile trafficking is going on, and um, that's because the elite of a corrupt bunch enjoy pedophilic activities. Um, <clears throat> how are they doing it? Well, like they're just tapping into regular child uh, sex trafficking, which they allegedly control. So it's not that surprising the theory itself. Okay, now. Um, pedophile charges in conspiracy theories might sound pretty crazy, but they're nothing new. Um, so if you go back to the 1850s, there's a real upsurge of anti-Catholicism in America. A lot of um, Catholic immigrants from Italy and from Ireland, and this led to a kind of backlash. Um, there's a series of books put out um, sort of depicting uh, Catholic priests as being deeply corrupt. Um, they, the, the, the basic line is, look, the Catholic priests take a vow of celibacy and this turns into sex-crazed monsters. 
Okay, so, um, and there's allegations of pedophilia mostly in nunneries, they get young girls in nunneries where no one can see what's going on and they molest them, okay? <coughs> um, and this led to people sort of surrounding nunneries and, you know, demanding to be let in and, you know, riots and, and so on, okay? Um, David Icke's alien reptiles are also pedophiles. Um, they also go hedonistic drug parties, kidnapping and uh, ritualistic sacrifice. Um, so this stuff is, it's not that unusual to see. Uh, it seems to be a sort of a smear that conspiracy theorists have um, often liked to run against um, whomever their target is. Um, the connection with Satan well, Satan makes frequent appearances in conspiracy theories. Um, so the OK City bomber was uh, motivated by um, what had gone in the Branch Davidian compound in Waco, Texas. The Branch Davidians believed that uh, the US government was allied with Satan. That's why they're fighting them. Um, if you look at <coughs> Heaven's Gate, the Californian suicide cult, they believed the world was being run by the Luciferians. Who are a bunch of basically a bunch of uh, followers of Satan. Okay, they're a secret elite running the world. Uh, if you look at Alm Shinriko, this is the sarin gas attack in uh, Tokyo in 19, 1993, I think. Um, they believe they were opposed to an alliance of Satan, Freemasons, and Jews. Okay, so these are the groups that they were mostly opposed to. Okay, so. Satan often gets involved in conspiracy theories. Okay? Nothing new there. Now, <clears throat> you might think, oh, well, maybe what's new is the connection between conspiracy theorizing and political power. Maybe what's really new here is Donald Trump promoting the conspiracy theories. <clears throat> um, but that's not really so new. So um, Hitler, of course, is a, you know, a very powerful leader who promoted a welter of anti-Semitic conspiracy theories in the late 1990s. President Mbeki in South Africa uh, pushed conspiracy theories about HIV AIDS and uh, you know, to have African solutions instead of Western drugs. Um, President uh, Bolsonaro of Brazil runs with a cluster of anti-communist conspiracy theories, which promotes his sort of right-wing agenda. So nothing new there. Also, nothing new in America. We've already seen the McCarthy example. McCarthy is a powerful US senator pushing conspiracy theories. Um, in the 1850s, and this is, this is related to the anti-Catholicism, there's a political party called the Know-Nothings. Um, their real name is the Native American Party, but they were more popularly known as the Know-Nothings because if you ask them about the conspiracy, they'd say, I know nothing. But the conspiracy is an anti, is a sort of, that they worry about is Catholic conspiracy. Um, they think the Pope is out to end democracy. Not entirely stupid, the Pope was anti-democracy at the time. Um, and they think that the, the Catholics in America, their first world to use the Pope, not to America. Um, <clears throat> led to several anti-Catholic riots, a bunch of people died in the 1850s at these riots. Okay, so nothing new there. Okay, and oh, the, the, the Know Nothing Party, I should have said, had about um, 40 representatives in the US Congress. Okay, <clears throat> final section, this is discussion of conspiracy theories online. So Muirhead and Rosenblum um, say, look, um, the online environment, it's helping this new conspiracism because um, it's so easy to repeat stuff online. And that seems right. But is it leading to more, more belief in conspiracy theories, all this repetition? Well, Oskinski and Parent um, did this study, um, a conspiracy talk in the US from the 18... 1890 to 2010, which if you'd attended Brian's talk, he also mentioned. And um, they may, they've got two key findings from it. The first is the overall disposition of the public in the US to discuss conspiracies to the 
increased slightly over time. And the second is discussion of conspiracy theories skyrockets and then fades away within a couple of years at certain times, such as in the Red Scare. So let me just show you the diagram. Um, I, I think I have to stop sharing this one. So I'll bring it up and I'll bring this one back. Um, so now we want to share. Okay, so there's the, the, the diagram you've seen this before if you attend Brian's talk. So there's the conspiracy theorizing talk fading over time in the US. Um, and there's, there's the Red Scare. We've probably had a big spike just up here with Donald Trump. But the, I mean, and, then, and you know, there's an interesting question. Is it going to disappear as quickly um, or is it going to keep going? So I'll stop sharing that and bring back the um, main thing, uh, running sheet. So here we are. Um, so there's been, so the, the internet got into widespread use in the late 90s, but there was, seems to be no increase in even the discussion of conspiracy theories offline between the mid 90s and 2000. So that's one reason to think, nah, there's not such a problem here. Still, you might think, well, things have gotten bad since 2010. So here's some reason to think that the rise of social media, it's mostly starts up between 2005 and 2010. It really gets going from 2010. Second thing is that algorithms are used on Facebook and YouTube, which um, if you uh, start looking at, um, say one bit of footage about conspiracy, you're likely to be uh, shown another and another and another. Um, and the third thing is that we have these new wonderful bots that um, merely repeat things online, including conspiracy theories. So, um, so there's, there's reasons to think that there's more repetition of conspiracy theories in the last 10 years. All right, well, that's all and well, but how many people actually believe conspiracy theories? Um, well, actually, not that many. So um, rigged elections. Um, in November 2020, 22% um, of Americans believed that the US federal election had been rigged. QAnon, it's only 7%. It's not that, it's not that high. Birth or allegations in 2010, 14%. Okay. Now, those are big figures. If you look at the number of millions of people who are actually behind that, but this is not big league. In the mid 90s, 90% 90 of Americans uh, preferred a Kennedy assassination theory over the official story. Also, 71% of Americans believe that the US government is withholding information about unidentified flying objects. Okay, Not necessarily that there are unidentified flying objects, but they're withholding something. Okay, um, so all this repetition is not causing more belief in conspiracy theories. And it's an interesting question why. Um, so I think the answer is, well, pro-conspiracy websites just aren't that popular. Um, so the most popular is this one called Infowar, Alex Jones, you've probably heard of. It's the 1,053rd most visited site, US site on the internet in 2019. Just not, uh, just not that popular. People have a limited interest in conspiracy theories. Most coverage of conspiracy theories is on mainstream websites. And on those sites, 63% of it is negative. Only 19% is positive and the rest is neutral. So most people, when they hear about a conspiracy theory, they hear it being mocked or they hear countervailing information. And that's not likely to make you believe a theory. So the other thing is, while it's true that conspiracy theorists are merely repeating things, there are anti-conspiracy theorists out there seem to be motivated to devote their time and energies to gathering evidence against conspiracy theories and going around debunking them. Now, the internet may or may not be good news for conspiracy theories, theorists, but it's very good for anti-conspiracy theorists because now they can target uh, people who accept conspiracy theories much more easily than they could in pre-internet days. 
Okay, final point. Um, so is the new conspiracism a threat to democracy, as Muirhead and Rosenbaum claim? Clearly not, because there is no new conspiracism. New conspiracism is just the old conspiracism dressed up. Okay? What about conspiracy theories as a whole? Are they a threat to democracy? Well, some of them probably are. Um, it's possible to think that conspiracy theories um, played a role in the overthrow of the Weimar Republic. So, yes, they are. But you've also got to consider the role in conspiracy theories in promoting uh, democracy. So, um, um, conspiracy theories can be used by anti-democrats, but they can also be used by pro-democrats. A clear example of this is the birth of America. If you read the US Declaration of Independence, it's basically a big conspiracy theory. There are a series of allegations, a long list of them, against King George and his British brethren. And they are allegedly conspiring to the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. Okay? Now, whether that was true or not, it's a conspiracy theory, and it motivated people to start a democracy. So um, conspiracy theories might be a threat to democracy, but they're not only a threat to democracy. Okay, thank you. Oh, sorry, my microphone was off. Um, thank you, Steve, for a great talk. And now we'll turn things over to the discussion portion of the night. So um, panelists, do you want to raise questions for Steve and before we turn things over to the audience? Who wants to go first? Why don't you go first, Brian? Ah, uh, okay. Well, I uh, first, first of all, thanks, Steve. I mean, I think it's it's a nice uh, discussion of putting. I mean, that I I was not familiar with that book before tonight, but now I feel like I should go go take a look at it. And I was actually trying to figure out, uh, you know, who who they were engaging with uh, when they wrote the book, uh, whether they are dealing with some of the academic literature around conspiracy theories. It sounds. Sounds like maybe they talk about Yusinski and the and the uh, uh, political science stuff. I'm I'm kind of curious whether they deal much with the philosophical work on conspiracy theories. I think they cite you. Um, okay, well then I like them. They're great. Yes. <laughs> uh, let me just confirm that. Uh, yeah. uh, yes, uh, you come up on page twenty five, but I think oh. it's a bit thin after that. So right. um, they might, you're right, they're mostly engaged with political theorists. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I guess, so, I mean, I think you make a pretty good case for how there's not a lot new in the new conspiracism that, mm. it, that, that they've done, they need to do more work to show that the current conspiracy theories are that much different from what we've seen that's what's come before. But I think as, one of the things I suggested in my talk is that I'm actually kind of open to the idea that that uh, some new waves and conspiracy theories as they happen on the hoof, as it were, uh, may be interestingly different. And I can say that part of my motivation for that is just based on the track record of other social phenomena. Uh, I mean, I'm thinking in particular of uh, an, another case of a popular uh, popular theory would be something like theories around creationism and and particularly the way in which uh, creationism has been a, a current in American thought for sure and, and Western thought more generally for you know thousands of years uh, or you know or at least a thousand years let's say uh, and it's and it's changed over time and, and in particular there's this really nice uh, historical change that happens between the night from the 1970s until the early 2000s, where at one point creationists were focused on this idea of scientific creationism, the idea that, well, our creationist theories are uh, uh, 
you know that that there that there's a way in which uh, the idea of scientific scientific creationism was this idea that we're going to treat our biblical creationism theories as scientific theories and and argue that our scientific theories are our theories of creation in terms of you know, a biblical flood and uh, the kinds of things that you can, you can take ideas out of the Bible and the Old Testament, and the New Testament, and map them on to testable hypotheses. And dang it, we think our hypotheses are as good, if not better than that stuff you get out of Darwin. And in, and even worse, where they had a, an account to say that, you know, there's something very unscientific about Darwin's theories that, you know, maybe they're not falsifiable in the right sorts of ways. And uh, that, uh, that, the, that, you know, their theories, the creationist theories are scientific, whereas Darwinism is not as scientific as maybe we're led to believe. And that, uh, that was a good 20 years of thought in creationist science and creationist uh, uh, ways of challenging uh, evolutionary theory. And then partly as a result to, of a number of court findings in the United States were showed, uh, which argued that no, no, you can't actually make that case, or at least you can't use those kinds of arguments to support, say, the teaching of creationism in the public schools in the United States. Uh, that, that that whole area of thought kind of got shut down, at least in the sense that it wasn't going to have the political impact that uh, the creationists wanted at the time. And then things kind of go moribund for a couple of years, and then you get the development of intelligent design theory, which is a completely different intellectual way of trying to think through uh, how creationism could be understood. Uh, and, it's, um, and, and it's looking at the philosophical foundations of evolutionary theory and actually starts bringing in sorts of interesting stuff from philosophy of biology and so forth mm -hmm. and, and work in probability theory. And it becomes a kind of a new way of trying to Again, the, the political goal is to raise the uh, the the stature of uh, biblically defined theory within the public schools and within the public discourse, and you, you get this kind of shifting, right? It's like you know, there's particular things that we want to happen as a group, and we we try to make so our theory uh, is going to be effective, and so you see these changes in how uh, different social groups change their tactics as they go along. And partly as a result of that, it's one of the things I've been kind of expecting to see at some point is that whatever creationism, or excuse me, whatever conspiracy theories looked like in the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, that at some point we should expect to see some kind of a change where you know people are just not gonna find those, those approaches, those tropes, those uh, ways of approaching conspiracy theories to be effective, uh, they're just going to become boring, right? It's just like people aren't going to talk about them as much because it's just the same old, same old thing. People just get tired of talking about JFK assassination. They get tired of talking about uh, the good old fashioned conspiracy theories and they'll come up with a new way of thinking through and, and making conspiracy theories new and relevant. And, and one way of understanding one, one, one of the reasons why I kind of think it's interesting to think about QAnon and Pizzagate is to try to look through it at that lens, through that lens of this idea of like, they are trying to repackage it in a way that will get attention, will get eyeballs and, and get people to uh, engage with it. So although I'm, I, I think you make a good case that, that at least what uh, the authors of this book do don't give us a a nice picture of something really new that you know you're you're really making a case that it's old wine and new bottles, uh, but I'm kind of curious to think: Do you really think there's really just nothing new about yeah, uh, yeah. the new conspiracies? Yeah. And maybe it isn't. Maybe those particular authors are overselling it. Uh, but if somebody were to push you push back on you and just go, "But come on, Steve, there's got to be something new going on here. I mean, why why are we paying any more attention to it now than uh, I mean?" You know, people who believed in JFK assassinations and moon landings weren't invading the Capitol. Uh, they weren't <laughs> doing. They were. There were certainly certainly new things going on that seemed to be connected to conspiracism in as it happens in the world. You know, is that just a fluke, or do you want to say no? Even that's not really yeah. new. Look, I mean, I'm very sympathetic to what you're saying. Um, and when I was developing this paper, I started um, thinking along these lines um, that there's probably something new here, but you and Rosenbaum have to put your finger on what it is. 
Um, and I should just say is by way of background. So I, I published a paper in 2007 in the journal Episteme, and um, I argue that the internet was starting to change conspiracy theories. Um, so my argument, um, and I, I don't spell this out in great detail, but actually Uskins, Joe Skinsey takes up a bit and adds flesh to it. But the, the, the gist of it is, I think um, conspiracy theories don't become as specific so quickly on the internet because they get criticised very early on. So the classic conspiracy theorist um, goes away, writes a big book, fleshes out the details of their theory, gets it published, and then bang, um, there's a big book explaining why um, Kennedy was assassinated by, you know, um, whomever. Um, the new ones um, put a bit of information um, about 9-11 on the internet and they get attacked. So they don't sort of, they don't go away and come up with a big theory, uh, which is then discussed. So the theories don't get developed as much. And that seemed to me to be right. So I'm, I'm very open to the idea that things might be changing in conspiracy world. Um, now, I started out when I was developing this paper thinking, look, what seems to be different about QAnon is the culture around it. You know, there's people running around with the letter Q and um, carrying on... Um, um, you know, there's, um, there's clothing and there's, there's a whole culture that's sort of developed around these Q drops and they organise. Um, but when I started reading about the know-nothings in the 1850s, it looked like there was a very similar thing going on. There were, apparently you could catch a know-nothing bus. Now, presumably the benefit of catching a know-nothing bus was that you wouldn't have to get Catholics on it, <laughs> right, because they would not. Uh, be game to get on a know-nothing bus. And there was sort of know-nothing paraphernalia that you could buy. Um, the other thing is, related to this, is um, um, so what seems interesting about conspiracy theories about Donald Trump, again, is that there are these uh, paramilitary groups like Proud Boys who get associated with it. Whether they believe any of this stuff is not clear, but um, um, but they're part of they're sort of part of the culture here. But again, that's happened before. Um, the Know Nothings had a welter of uh, paramilitary groups who were sort of anti-Catholics. Um, there's a wonderful group called the Plug Uglies who um, ran around in big top hats. That um, so if you see the film Gangs of New York, I think they depicted and um, uh, they're, they're basically param par a Protestant paramilitary group. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm very open to the idea that there's something new. I'd like to find something new. I think the internet is a new environment. Um, I'm just, um, this line of research hasn't produced anything new. I don't think QAnon is new. Great, thanks, Steve. Can I come in? Sorry, can I? Yeah, can I come in? Um, mm -hmm. Uh, okay, prefacing that this is all with bad conspiracy theories, which I would like sometimes to point out. Um, look, one of the things where it might be new is a problem I always saw with Steve's analysis that you know what's wrong with some conspiracy theories is that they form the core of degenerating research programs. And the problem as I saw it was um, a, a theory has to go through quite a number of iterations before you can say it's degenerating. Because, mm. you know, that's, that's you know, the, the, the Lakatosian concept of a degenerating research uh, program is you have theory one, hardcore auxiliary hypothesis, predictions don't pan out, uh, you retain the hardcore, amend the auxiliary hypotheses, and this goes through a few iterations, and the theory is bad if it's not predicting new things, um, and if um, its, its predictions are systematically falsified, requiring more and more elaborate um, auxiliary hypotheses. The trouble with that as an analysis of what's wrong with conspiracy theories struck me is most bad conspiracy theories don't go through enough iterations. 
and there isn't kind of an environment where someone is putting forward um, um, objections. These are being taken seriously. You know, you say, all oh, right, that's counter evidence. So now I'm amending my theory, right? Um, uh, what might be different is that the internet might speed up the process so that you do get the right number of iterations so that um, uh, um, 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 some conspiracy theories look more like degenerating research programs than I, perhaps I think other ones did because not enough iterations, you know, you just get one theory and then there really isn't any change to the theory in the face of counter argument with the debate. Maybe the internet, as it were, <laughs> makes, makes accepting that there are some conspiracy theories which look like degenerating research programs, maybe the internet makes more of them like that. I mean, I had it in the 2007 paper exactly the other way around. So I thought that the theories don't get developed enough to sort of have a hard core that right. um, can be developed, uh, can be protected in a way, in the right sort of way. Whereas I thought the old theories were going through this process. So we'd have to look at some of the old, we'd have to go into the detail of these old theories. I mean, do you have any particular old theories in mind that don't go oh. through these iterations? No, I mean, I, I always thought it was a problem with your approach that, that, you know, that typically they don't go through enough iterations. But I'm not, I'm not convinced that that is the case. It may just be... Right, right. Now, maybe, maybe you're right. And, and the, the other thing was, I, I, I think that, um, you know, the Lakatosian model of a research program in science, but it, he, he also thinks there can be philosophical research programs which degenerate, but in a slightly different way. Um, uh, is that you are in an arena where people are taking refutations. You, you always have to so, quote marks because Lakatosh's refutations aren't refutations in the sort of strong Pyrrhian sense. Right? Take refutations seriously. Mm. Uh, not, not to the sense that they come out with their hands up, but where they say, oh yeah, that's a real problem. We're going to have to think about that. How about this as a way of you know, maintaining yeah, yeah, yeah. our core. That's his idea, yeah. And um, uh, the arena of debate in which conspiracy theories, bad conspiracy theories are developed is, is not one where people are playing the game as they are ideally supposed to be playing in, in, a, in a, a scientific debate. So, um, I mean, that struck me as a problem Previously, but we'd uh, have to go to the detail here and see. We would, we would, we would. Yeah, yeah, yeah. An actual debate about, say, the JFK theory or whatever, and see how it develops. Because, um, you, you know, I mean, this would be a sort of almost a sociological analysis of um, how a debate pans out in a community. And granting that these communities are not trained in philosophy science, so what they're going to do, I think, is going to roughly approximate this process. Yeah. And you presumably think he's not going to approximate it. Uh, well, I thought in the, yes, I mean, and uh, you're right, it has to be detailed, but you know, I, I just thought they probably didn't go through enough iterations. The, the environment where not one in which you just like blast through counter evidence rather than taking it seriously or just ignore it. Um, uh, you, you might have, you know, very articulate conspiracy theories, you know, and I'm, again, you know, we'll assume that these are something wrong with them. But, you know, the people are articulate. They've got a, a proper theory. They've, they've worked it all out. They are alive to the possibility of refutation um, and um, want to engage with people in a sort of serious way. Um, Whereas, of course, often what you have with bad conspiracy theories is people just don't. You know, they're not interested in coming up to the level where you can, they're, they're in order to have a degenerating research, the research program, you've got to rise to a certain level of rationality. Um, and maybe, you know, quite often people just don't. 
It's a possibility. I mean, we'd have to go to the evidence and yeah. this. I mean, there are anti-conspiracy theorists out there who seem motivated to, they think it's their good deed or whatever, to go and attack conspiracy theories. So, um, and then there's a question of do, are there sufficiently many of them to engage with conspiracy theorists? Do conspiracy theorists, um, you know, um, revise their theories to take account of the objections? We'd really have to do the work to uh, yeah. you know, figure this one out. So I'm. Oh, 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 I, I, I did have I'll I let, let him go. Uh, so, yeah. So, first of all, Steve, thank you for a great paper. I've been waiting for a kind of definitive knockdown of the Muirhead and Rosenblum book for a while. And I think you go through all of the necessary things to show that the new conspiracism is not actually new. It's just the old conspiracism. It's just conspiracism, basically. Because yeah. um, I think there, there are kind of two problems with the kind of project they engage in. The first is they just, they lack any historical nuance when it comes to discussion of conspiracy theories. And I think a great example about. of this, sorry, sorry? Yeah, they don't know what they're talking about. Yeah, but go on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so one great example, which they, which because they talk about QAnon, the fact they don't talk about this example is quite telling. They don't talk about the obvious precursor to QAnon, which isn't Pizzagate. It's the Iraqi Dina revaluation conspiracy theory. Oh, I don't know about this. So no oh, yeah, so yeah, so oh, yeah, I'll I'll give people a short history of the Iraqi Dina revaluation sure. conspiracy theory. So after the first Gulf War, when America destroyed the Iraqi economy for the first time, a whole bunch of people went, hmm, America's going to step in. They're going to rebuild the infrastructure in Iraq and the dinar is going to jump up in value again. So I'm going to buy all of the dinar as foreign currency as possible. And then when America rebuilds Iraq, I'm going to sell that for a fortune. And as we know, that didn't happen. And so people started, that. yeah, people started developing conspiracy theories about, oh, actually, the US Department of State, they also bought up a large amount of dinner, and they're just waiting for the right moment for the rebuild. So they started developing all these conspiracy theories to explain why the dinar was not jumping up in value. They even made some predictions that maybe America was going to evade Iraq again, and lo and behold, uh, Desert Storm 2 occurred. And then they started developing new conspiracy theories to explain why the DNA wasn't jumping up in value again. And then as the theory became more complicated by the fact that their predictions were failing to obtain, there was no revaluation of the dinar to make it really profitable. They started making claims about other government experiments going on in the background. So you find that people who still subscribe to the Iraqi dinar revaluation th uh, theory today now believe in things like stargates to other planets. So one of the reasons why America has not rebuilt Iraq is that Saddam Hussein was hiding a stargate, which allows US military personnel to travel uh, to foreign worlds. And they're keeping that technology suppressed because they rebuilt the infrastructure that information would get out. There are UFO conspiracy th theories associated with it. I believe there's even Nazi Antarctic based conspiracy theories involved now with why the DNR has never been revalued due to a rebuild. And so it's a conspiracy theory that emerges in the early 90s, at the time we get the birth of the internet, and has gone through the same kind of mutation and evolution that we've also seen with Pizzagate as it became QAnon. It's a conspiracy theory where there are changing goalposts, so that from a historical perspective we go, this theory looks completely incoherent, but actually, if you look at the theory as a kind of step-by-step -step basis, you can see that as one prediction fails to obtain, they then go, oh, we need to change the core of our theory to explain why our predictions aren't working. So we'll drag in some auxiliary hypotheses, make them central to our discussion. And so the theory goes from why isn't my currency going up to why are the Americans hiding stargates to other planets in the middle of, of Baghdad. And so there's, there's some, some nice examples that show that their new conspiracism, as you point out, is completely wrong. 
It's just the old conspiracies, and we find examples of theories of this type going back through history. And this leads on me to the, the second point, which is a point which I made in the problem of conspiracism in that special issue of Argumenta on conspiracy theories, which is an awful lot of the discussion we get about conspiracy theorists and their beliefs confuses notable qua weird beliefs with the phenomena of conspiracy theories generally. So yeah, you can pick out really unusual conspiracy theories like QAnon, Pizzagate, or the Iraqi Dinar revaluation hypothesis. But the question isn't, you know, what, what are they weird? The question is more, how typical or, or normal are these beliefs when it comes to conspiracism in this day and age? So I think they, I, I think you're right. They don't know their history. So they basically get the history of conspiracy theorizing completely wrong. And I also think they're kind of engaging in mistaking notability for prevalence and then drawing really, really broad conclusions from a very limited and skewed data set. Yeah, well, uh, thank you for those comments. Um, couldn't agree more. And thank you for telling me and enlightening me about this Iraqi DNR reevaluation theory, which sounds most remarkable. Um, look, weird and wonderful conspiracy theories have been around for a very long time. If you start reading about these anti Catholic conspiracy theories in the 1850s, they are, some of them are very wacky. Um, they sort of get caught up with the Illuminati. Um, and um, Catholic priests um, get up to all sorts of, or alleged to get up to all sorts of mischief. So, um, you know, I mean, the conspiracy theorist has always had a fertile imagination. There is, there is no doubt about that. Okay, is, further, I think is, Charles is, has another. Uh, this, this is just, you know, a, a minor historical point. You said, you know, that um, in the 1850s, the Pope was an opponent of democracy. That's Pius IX. Leo XIII, very much less so. Did any of these conspiracy theories uh, uh, drop off with the new Pope? I'm not sure. Um, what caused the Know Nothing Party to drop off was the US Civil War. So the, the Know Nothing Party was really driving these conspiracy theories. And um, the Know Nothing Party was rather split between its northern and southern branches about the issue of slavery. And they tried to finesse the issue. Um, but um, after the Dred Scott decision, which I think is 1857, you couldn't, you couldn't sit on the sidelines anymore. Um, and so basically the party collapsed the Northern Know Nothing sort of fell in with the Republican Party, which was an anti-slavery party, and the Southern Know Nothing sort of fell in with the Democratic Party. So, um, you know, and, and that was the end of it. And then after the Civil War, people had better things to worry about than anti-Catholicism. So that, that, I think that's how it ended. Right, I mean, I just, just interested. Yeah, uh, it is I, interesting. The, the other thing I wanted to say is um, the true enough point. Um, you could have a perfectly good conspiracy theory, well, fairly good, and um, but wrong in some significant detail. So you could say, uh, well, um, I'm pretty sure that some uh, element of the American Secret Services was in on this operation. And you can say, you think it was the FBI? Well, it wasn't the FBI, it was the CIA. You know, um, that, that's the sort of thing you could have a, you know, you could have a sensible conspiracy theory, basically mm -hmm. true, but with a false element in it. And, you yeah. know, so you could have a good conspiracy theory uh, where there's a mistake in it and you can say, well, it's true enough. Um, I, I, you've got the sort of the, the, the main facts about uh, a right. Or, you know, I was thinking, let's suppose, you know, among the very many uh, JFK conspiracy theories was that uh, it was a Cuban operation. And in fact, it seems that um, uh, uh, LBJ himself suspected this. Okay, but then we say, um, are, are they sufficiently powerful and efficient to do it by themselves? 
Oh, well, maybe not. They'd need the help of some other communist um, secu uh, security service to help them. And you might say oh, it would have been the KGB. And then, you know, again, you can turn up. Suppose it wasn't the KGB. Suppose it was Stasi. Mm. Yeah. I mean, these are all occasions where, uh, you know, uh, true enough to get the basis of the conspiracy theory, you know. Well, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you know, it could be plausible. It could be silly. You know, it's, it doesn't seem to me a thing that, that makes a, a, a huge amount of difference, um, you know. Right. So it really can be true enough. So, so I think, um, so there might be two senses of true enough here. Hmm. So think of it in the Lakatoshi way, um, where true enough is true enough to defend the core theory. Yeah. Um, so you've got a theory, um, you've got auxiliary assumptions, and uh, someone challenges an auxiliary assumption and you say, yeah, okay, I've got another auxiliary assumption that I now can bring in. And they had assistance from the, uh, the KGB. Um, but the theory, um, you know, my core theory that it was um, the Cubans who killed JFK, that stands. Yeah. But the way I was thinking about Donald, and this is specifically Trump's uh, true enough, that, which is what uh, Rosenbaum, you and Rosenbaum are, are concerned about, is true enough to establish a particular point. So true enough for a political purpose. Now, now these two are not always going to come apart. But um, so the way I was thinking about it um, was more along the lines of what do I want to achieve politically by promoting a conspiracy? So um, promoting this conspiracy theory about Barack Obama, well, what I want to achieve is having, you know, not um, legitimate, not allowed to be US president anymore. So I'm going to promote the theory. If it turns out that um, I got a detail wrong, it wasn't Kenya, it was Tanzania, it was, um, you know, somewhere or other else, well, that's true enough because it um, does the work I want to achieve by promoting this conspiracy theory. So this is a slightly more cynical use of the, uh, the true enough, true enough for a political purpose rather than true enough to defend the core of the theory. But both strike me as legitimate takes on the phrase true enough. And actually, I have an example which predates their new conspiracism of the same thing. So Aotearoa, New Zealand's most famous right-wing intellectual, I'm going to put intellectual there in scare, scare, uh, scare quotes, which is the neo-Nazi sympathizer Kerry Bolton. In his dissertation, which apparently was meant to be for a PhD, he writes something along the lines of, now we know the protocols of the elders of Zion are a fraud, but spiritually, they're true. So he tries to do the, they're not real, but it's, it's true enough to make the following point about the pernicious plot of the Jews to take over right. the world. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I've never heard of this important New Zealand conspiracy theorist, but that-, that He's not that like important, the... but he is our, he is our best extreme right <laughs> intellectual, which is not saying much. I'm simply saying of a bad crop, he is the best. He is the best. Well, um, I'm, yeah. I'm pleased to hear that New Zealand is making its contribution to um, conspiracy <laughs> theorizing around the world. But yeah, I mean, that does sound like he's, um, he has true enoughness of uh, some variety or other in mind. Yes. Yeah. And I mean, my, my example then was the lavender scare that, um, this is, this is true enough for a political purpose. So if you can establish that someone is homosexual and they're an employee of the government, you can have them sacked, you can fuel the red scare by you know, showing up more problems. And if you buy the, um, the uh, McCarthy Hoover theory, you've actually shown that they have many of the um, psychological traits that lead to either or both of homosexuality or communism. Um, th there's a kind of interesting side literature on this, by the way, of uh, McCarthy persecuting um, psychoanalysts for not go along, going along with his theory that um, homosexuality and communism are, uh, 
you know, a unified form of mental illness. So, um, you know, people were obviously asked about this and most of them said that's batshit crazy. And um, so he then pursued them. And that they were sort of easy targets because they're mostly from Europe who um, come over to America and they, um, uh, they came up with complicated theories that ordinary people found hard to understand. So McCarthy was quite successful with this. Um, it, it, that's interesting. I, I didn't know about this insanity thing, you know, like communism is a form of mental illness, but it explains something which I, I have read, which is about the, um, uh, the former communist who was an informant uh, to some of the you know, Cold War anti-communist activities, Whitaker Chambers. And Whitaker Chambers insisted that, um, no, I wasn't insane when I was a communist. I was an idealist. This was my ideology. This is why I was doing this stuff. Um, I was wrong, but it, there was nothing mad about it. Um, and I thought, why is he making such a fuss? Well, obviously he was reacting to this line of propaganda. Yes, yeah, well, for sure. So the idea that was communism is a form of sort of moral degeneracy and, um, you know, it showed various character defects that were related with mental illness. Related to the um, Listen, and it I should be pointed out that the that the you saw the same thing on the Soviet Union side as well as that people who showed oh, yeah. capitalistic tendencies yeah. or belief in the West they were mentally ill, right? It, so it was it was it was just another example of the Soviet Union, both sides of the Cold War, kind of aping each other in terms of the the forms of the arguments that they were making and the accusations that they were making against their opponents. Yeah, and also, I mean, psychoanalytic sort of thinking was held in high esteem in the 1950s. So this was an effective sort of uh, approach uh, at the time. Um, thanks for the panelists for a great round of discussions. Um, we have some questions coming in for the Q&A, and I wonder if I could turn to some of the uh, student and alumni questions that I'm seeing. Um, one is... Um, Maybe just um, asking for a clarification about your use of the term conspiracy theory and the all important issue of the definition of conspiracy theory. She writes, at what point does an idea or, or thought uh, that someone has about an event become a conspiracy theory? So maybe you can go through again how you're using that term. Right. So I'm following Brian here. So let me bring up the definition again. Um, so I need to do the share screen thingy. Uh, there it is. Share this. So um, here's the Kiwi definition. Page two. So there we are. Hopefully you can see this. So Kiwi says conspiracy theory proposed explanation for some historical event or events in terms of the significant causal agency of a relatively small group of people, the conspirators acting in secret. So, so what the question is, when does a theory become a conspiracy theory? Um, I mean, it, it might start fully, it might start as a conspiracy theory because you might simply propound this. A theory might become conspiratorial over time when you begun, begin to suspect that some, um, some phenomena that is occurring is actually the result of manipulation by a small number of people behind the scenes. Okay? So when you start to suspect that, uh, a non-conspiracy theory could turn into a conspiracy theory. Once you start thinking there's this small group of people acting in secret to cause whatever phenomenon you're trying to analyze, I think that's when a theory becomes a conspiracy theory. Was that helpful? Can, can I come in as well? Um, sure. Um, I, I think maybe another issue is how organized does a speculation or a set of ideas have to be to be a theory, right? So you, so you might say, that's yeah. not really a theory. It's just a bunch of, you know, intellectual mush. Um, uh, in the tradition, which I think many of us come from, namely, you know, with a, a strong background in philosophy of science, uh, theories don't have to be very complicated counter theories. Yeah. Um, 
we're accustomed to using toy examples of really, really simple theories to illustrate a point. So uh, the bar from being just a bunch of ideas to being a theory is, is set fairly low. So there's two issues. How conspiratorial does a theory have to be to be a conspiracy theory? And how theoretical does a theory have to be to be a conspiracy theory? Yeah. Uh, and I think that, that I suspect most of the panel would say, yeah, not, not very complicated, not very elaborate. But, I, I concur, yeah. But, but, the, but actually, the ones that, that, that Steve was talking about, it were actually moderately elaborate. Um, uh, so even if you set the bar a bit higher, I would say they met that bar. I think that's right. I think, you know, I'm pretty liberal with my use of the term theory. Um, there's another question about social media platforms and whether you think they're maybe going too far in fighting against conspiracy theories, you know, banning uh, Trump from Twitter, et cetera. Ooh, or, good question. Yeah, and also a related question about whether you think that just having the enough of these anti-conspiracy theorists, would that be enough to fight conspiracy theory? Or how do you think social media should be handling con uh, conspiracy theories? Yeah, so... I think something that's really important is the algorithms. So think about YouTube. Um, so you look at a, a video about anything. Um, say you look at a video about someone playing golf. And pretty soon at the top of your feed, there's a whole bunch more videos of people playing golf. Um, so, and it's the same with conspiracy theory. It seems to be quite good if, if you uh, look at a conspiracy theory, um, up pops, you know, um, close to the top of the page, other stuff about conspiracy theories. And you naturally, you know, I mean, YouTube is really good at uh, getting you to sort of click on a lot of these things. Um, now, what seems to me to be crucial here in ensuring that you know people don't just sort of get sucked into conspiracy theories all the time is that the algorithms are tweaked in such a way that the uh, the discussions of conspiracy theories you're going to see in your feed are both positive and negative. Okay, so if you look on a um, you look at a video on QAnon, it's pro QAnon, and then YouTube starts throwing up 101 other pro QAnon theories, then YouTube is giving you a biased sample. However, if YouTube is, you look at a video pro QAnon theory, and then it recommends and sort of shows at the top of your feed, um, you know, a mix of pro-QAnon and anti-QAnon, then it's not giving you a biased sample and it's actually promoting research. Um, and that, that's a sort of a subtle tweak to the algorithm. Um, and that they're, they're making these little tweaks on the algorithms all the time and that they're actually like people running Facebook, you, they're, they're running little experiments on people unbeknownst to them. I'm sure they're not getting, um, they're not going through research committees to do these and getting informed consent and so on. Um, they're just tweaking these algorithms and they actually have a big dip. They make a big difference to um, what information people get and they're mucking around with them. Um, so I think um, I would be in favour of legislation actually trying to compel them to um, give, you know, make these algorithms even handed, uh, at least in respect of conspiracy theories and possibly in respect of other topics. Um, now, should uh, Donald Trump be banned from Twitter? I don't know. Um, I tried to follow it. Um, and I thought that, you know, he's, um, he's doing some incendiary stuff, but is it the, the actual things that he got banned for didn't strike me as any more incendiary than stuff he'd done in the past. But I mean, I, I take it the people who are banning him are sort of thinking about what's happening on the ground as in combination with um, what he's saying. Should he, um, 
you know, should he have been banned um, for a long period? Or uh, I think he's permanently banned, although maybe there's a kind of uh, way he can get back. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, last time I heard he's going to start his own social media platform. So um, if that is a success, um, he won't need Twitter or anything else. Um, uh, I'm not sure what this thing is going to be called. Um, he wouldn't be the he wouldn't be the first um, right wing politician to try and start a uh, social media platform. Um, maybe some of you heard of a British politician called Louise Mensch. Um, so Louise Mensch tried to uh, she, she was a big deal in Britain because she's basically the hottest. Um, conservative, so she's been a celebrity and so forth. And she tried to start something called Mention, which was a bit like Twitter. Um, anyway, it, it didn't seem to take off. Um, but maybe Trump, with his higher profile, will be successful. I don't know. I mean, I'd be interested to find out. Um, yeah, so the banning, I mean, the other thing that was going on was the um, removing of parlour from the um, various um, servers that were running it. And it, it did seem to me that Parlour was um, full of all kinds of people promoting violence. So that one struck me as more obvious. I, I'm, I'm really in two minds about banning Trump, but maybe other members of the panel have a view on this. I think what's also interesting is that from the perspective of the Antipodes, we have a slightly different view on the whole free speech debate that, say, the standard American does, given that we don't have kind of free speech built into our constitutional rights and things. We have a, you might say, you might say either a nuanced or a naive view of the whole free speech debate. What I thought was interesting about the banning of Trump on Twitter, because you're right, Steve, he didn't seem to be saying anything particularly new and incendiary. It was almost as if Twitter had caught up with the incendiary things he said in the past. And this has been a recurrent complaint about social media in general, in that when you join social media, there's a whole bunch of things you, you, you agree to, whether explicitly or tacitly, depending on whether you're the kind of person who reads a EULA or not. And it turns out that some people, if they're particularly prominent or famous, can get away with breaking those rules with impunity. Whilst normal people like ourselves, if we break those rules, we get 24-hour bans, 48-hour bans, and permanent bans quite quickly. So I think the problem with Twitter banning Trump was more Twitter is just inconsistent with respect to the rules it uses to decide whether someone should be on the platform or not and thus it looks as if we or we're you know we're, we're pulling poor president trump's support system of being able to talk to the people the president of the free world has many avenues to communicate with the public he does not need twitter uh, i mean they, they they literally have a podium as leader of the free world so the problem isn't twitter bad banning trump it's twitter being utterly inconsistent with respect to the way that it applies the rules it claims users have to adhere to. And actually on the al al algorithm side, so I was at a conference on social media and disinformation last week down in Dunedin where I got to catch up with Charles. And one of the things that Twitter is pushing for is not regulation over its algorithm because the corporates social media giants do, do not want regulation, they want to self-police. They're pushing for what's called algorithmic choice. The idea that there'll be a variety of different algorithms that you are able to choose to filter your feed. And so if you want a feed which is largely political, the algorithm will push political tweets up to the top. If you want an algorithm which is mostly cat pictures, it'll push cat pictures up to the top. So they are aware that there are these algorithmic issues. They just don't want people to look at the algorithm. They want us to trust that they can fiddle with the algorithm and get those desirable results. And I think that's a kind of interesting issue we're going to see in the next few years 
is whether the social media giants can avoid government regulation by providing algorithmic choice or whether it's going to turn out, no, actually, there is a pathway to red, red, radicalization that many of these algorithms seem to naturally lead to. And maybe these algorithms have to be regulated by some independent body after all. Right, right. Okay, yeah. I mean, it's really interesting to see how that will pan out. Um, I mean, you, you do get these cases where the self-policing is actually harsher uh, than the, uh, the external policing. So, um, you know, again, interesting to see that. Um, I think we have time for one more question. And um, I know that many of the panelists might want to weigh in on this uh, question. So um, Nate writes, colloquially, uh, conspiracy theories are thought to be untrue. So this is conspiracy theory is like a, pe a pejorative term, right? Yeah. People immediately disregard them. But considering that conspiracy theories are occasionally true, or at least partially true, is the popular misconception of conspiracy theories potentially dangerous? If so, are there any historical or current instances where these dangers are apparent? So I think many of you might want to take a crack at this question. Um, yeah, let's see, I think you go Charles first. is going to have a crack, so I'll get yeah. in first. Um, okay. I, I would so say I just totally... Oh, oh sorry. First. Did you say you wanted to get in first? Sorry. I, I wanted to get in first. No, you I, get in first, I, Steve. You get in first, Steve. Well, I think that um, for politicians being able to dismiss their opponents by saying that's just a conspiracy theory, uh, is a big problem. We saw this uh, with Blair and Bush being able to say uh, um, people who oppose them when they say, you know, Iraq is hiding uh, weapons of mass destruction, that are oh, they just conspiracy theorists? So this was an effective rhetorical uh, ploy which was cynically manipulated. So I think there is a danger in, in the, the sort of... Um, the uh, the ordinary way of speaking of conspiracy theories as obviously wrong, because you can dismiss a perfectly good theory by saying that's just a conspiracy theory, um, and many people say, ah, well, it's a conspiracy theory, it's obviously wrong, and then the people who are promoting the theory have a uh, job against them uh, you know, because they want to promote a theory that's about a conspiracy, but they have to. Now they're sort of in a rhetorical sort of um, tough position of having to say, yes, it's a conspiracy theory and it's true, but it's it's not one of those bad conspiracy theories. And, and that's a difficult thing to finesse. Okay, yeah, I mean, you can do it, but uh, tricky. So I would be in favour of reforming the language, okay? And um, But how exactly you do that, I don't know. Charles? Um, well, time is running, so let me see. I basically agree with the question. I, I, I would like, my whole program is to remove the pejorative connotations from the term conspiracy theory. So that whether or not something is a conspiracy theory, that's not the issue. The question is whether it's a good theory, whether it's a plausible theory. And it's one of the reasons why I think this is very important is precisely that, um, true conspiracy theories can be uh, discounted. And uh, yeah, my favorite example is precisely the one that Steve talked about. What happened was, here's a conspiracy theory, which is true, right? And it's that um, the Bush Blair administ uh, administrations conspired to talk up the threat of weapons of mass destruction in order to justify the second Gulf War. Right? We know they conspired because we know now some of the secret documents in which they basically did this. Um, and they were talking it up. I don't think they were always consciously lying, um, but they were certainly making much more of it than was really there. They might have taken themselves in by their own propaganda. Anyway, when people suggested this, they said, oh, that's a conspiracy theory. So on the basis of um, they, they dismissed that one, they were themselves running a conspiracy theory, but because it's, you know, I'm going to say white guys that are running this conspiracy theory, 
it's not a conspiracy theory. So their conspiracy was successful campaign by uh, Saddam Hussein to acquire ma ma weapons of mass destruction. They conspired to push this conspiracy theory. And when other people challenged them um, and said, aren't you conspiring to talk up this threat? They said, that's just a conspiracy theory. And what happened? Well, there was a terrible war and hundreds of thousands of people died. Hundreds of thousands of people died. And um, a whole country was laid to waste, its economy destroyed. Uh, um, it was a totally unjustified war and it was a complete disaster. And it was facilitated by one, the use of a conspiracy theory and the use of anti-conspiracist rhetoric to denounce the conspiracy to promote a conspiracy theory. So if you take away the pejorative connotations, they wouldn't have been able so easily to get away with that. And maybe, you know, hundreds of thousands of people who are now dead might have been alive. Yeah, I think I, I would I would throw in, I mean, so part of what this question is asking, which I think is a good question to ask, is you know. To, to provide examples of things which were called a conspiracy theory to begin with. And then later on with, you know, further reflection, we feel like, you know, maybe uh, they were things that ought to be believed in. Uh, I mean, I think we've already mentioned that, you know, the early days of the Watergate break in, uh, people proposed that uh, Nixon might be behind it. And people were, con were called conspiracy theorists, uh, you know, before Woodward and Bernstein and Deep Throat were able to kind of bring that to light. Uh, the, the weapons of mass destruction in uh, Iraq is certainly one. Uh, one of my favorites is, uh, I'll put it into the, um, into the chat. Uh, the, during the 1960s, uh, left-wing groups in particular in the United States uh, often traffic in the idea that they thought that the FBI was tapping their phones, was uh, infiltrating their groups, was doing all sorts of nefarious things behind the scenes. Uh, the FBI denied this uh, vociferously and, and accused uh, uh, people on the left wing uh, and in these groups as being fantasists of one sort or another. And it wasn't until uh, a group of activists broke into the FBI offices in a uh, FBI field office in uh, Medea, Media, Pennsylvania. Actually, I think literally 50 years ago this week uh, is when that break-in happened because it was during the night of the uh, Frazier Ali uh, fight, uh, which I think we just had the 50th anniversary of a, a week or two ago, uh, when people broke into that uh, office and then liberated all of the files, uh, it was discovered that no, in fact, the FBI had been doing these things behind the you know, behind closed doors for many many years, and uh, Betty Metzger was one of the journalists who received information from those left of leftist activists who themselves kept their own uh, participation in that burglary secret for a good forty years. Uh, and it's a really fascinating story uh, if you're interested in that. And if you want a more recent one, I mean, other than somebody like Edward Snowden. Uh, revealing all sorts of things, although I think as M pointed out in a in a previous uh, session here that uh, some people think that maybe Edward Snowden is actually a plant and that we shouldn't believe what he says. Uh, there's also all sorts of interesting stuff about the use of the Stingray technology, which is a law enforcement uh, for years have been using basically fake cell phone sites where they can get people, you know, they put out a fake cell phone site and then anybody in the area can uh, their cell phone will connect to it and it'll just let the, you know, it'll act like a normal cell phone site, except that they're snooping. They're a, a man in the middle. It's a man in the middle type of attack. And again, uh, there was a uh, particular uh, person who was actually committing fraud. Uh, he's pr pr committing uh, credit card fraud. And when he got caught, he was convinced that there was no way that he could have been caught unless somebody was secretly tapping in to his cell phone uh, activity uh, and raised this as part of his legal defense and was shot down. But it was only uh, actually a year or two afterwards that we discovered uh, what's called Stingray, which is the technology that police have been using uh, in the United States now for a number of years to act as a man in the middle to actually uh, uh, surveil uh, in a wiretapping sort of way, wiretapping cell phones. Uh, but again, when it was first revealed, or at least first suspected, uh, again, it was shut down. And, it, and this was a conspiracy 
that was kept by thousands of people, law enforcement agencies all around the United States were using this technology uh, effectively and keeping it a secret such that uh, the public and particularly they wanted to make sure criminals didn't know this was a possibility, uh, but they were able to keep it secret for a good 10 years, it seems, uh, before it was finally revealed that, uh, that the law enforcement uh, was doing this and with dubious legality, uh, because they weren't necessarily getting warrants for doing this because it wasn't clear that legally they necessarily had to get it. So they wanted to keep it secret uh, just so that somebody wouldn't actually uh, make a, a case to the Supreme Court and have it shut down. Uh, so there's a number of different cases that you could point to of, of things that people were called conspiracy theorists uh, in a pejorative sense, and then turned around and found out, yeah, actually there seems to be now pretty good evidence that you know, the, the thing that was being conspiracy, conspiracy theorized about turns out to be pretty plausible. Uh, uh, another one is the Congress for Cultural Freedom, which was an anti-communist cultural organization. Um, and people suspected that it was a CIA front. And it was. <laughs> but for a long time, that wasn't admitted. Now you can go to the CIA website and they boast about it. In the same respect that abstract expressionism was promoted by the CIA in yeah, Europe to show the, to show the super, the superiority of American art over those decadent European <laughs> artists, yeah, there's a, there's just this really long history of governments engaging in conspiratorial activity, and yeah, so that's CIA, why we we need to avoid this pejorative term. The CIA had a modernist aesthetic. Yeah. <laughs> All right, great, everyone, thanks. This, I think it's a great place to end. And I wanna thank everyone for showing up tonight, especially Steve for giving the talk and the panelists for joining in and for the attendees for showing up. Yeah, yeah, and thanks for your great answers to the questions. Um, we will meet again um, for the fourth installment of this colloquium series on Tuesday, April 6th, where David Cody will be talking about why he's not talking about conspiracy theories. So hopefully we'll see everyone back then at that date. Um, the link will be on the um, the website for those who are looking for that. And um, thanks again for everyone for uh, a fantastic discussion tonight. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you everyone. Thank you. It was very good. <laughs>